Okay, guys. Uh, as I said, we use this uh, Wooler test um, to find or to uh, measure the endurance strength of the material. Uh, but the, the endurance strength value itself has um, lots of factors that affect it, uh, not only the level of the stress. So this makes the fatigue uh, experiment very challenging. Um, and based on that, they, they, they were just thinking of finding some other like, um, ways around that. Uh, one way around that is um, shown here in this curve. You see, um, they've tried to find a relation between the endurance strength or the endurance limit and the tensile strength of the material. Um, for example, if you look at the steel in this range, you, hear, you have here tensile strength of the material, and here you have the ratio uh, is uh, endurance strength is e over the ultimate strength. So for, for steels, um, a specific range of uh, tensile strength, so this ratio is equal to 0 0.5. So it just means that uh, SE or the endurance limit is equal to 0 0.5 multiplied by the ultimate tensile strength. So what's what's easy about that um, is the ultimate tensile strength can be found using the simple tensile test uh, that we do. So using the simple tensile test, you can find the ultimate tensile strength multiply this value by 0 0.5. And this gives you the endurance uh, strength. So for the titanium, it is a little bit higher than 0 0.6. Um, so it means that the endurance strength of the titanium is higher than the steel. That's why they use it in aerospace uh, applications or engineering, uh, given that uh, the endurance strength is high and it is of light weight as well. Uh, so uh, for cast iron, it's around 0 0.4. So SE is equal to 0 0.4. Um, is ultimate. This is for cast iron. Uh, but for aluminum, you see the curve. So it's not like um, it doesn't have a specific straight line or the ratio changes depending on the tensile strength of uh, the material. So this is what I said uh, for, um, for steel within a specific range of ultimate tensile strength, uh, the endurance limit is equal to 0 0.5 multiplied by the ultimate uh, tensile strength of the material. For cast iron it is 0 0.4, for titanium it is a little bit higher than 0 0.6. Um, but as we said earlier, um, if you don't have the data available uh, based on the real or lab uh, experiment for the uh, endurance limit, so you can use these um, equations. You can use this equation for steel, uh, within the specific range of um, ultimate tensile strength, uh, if the material that you are using has um, uh, is ultimate lower than or equal to 1200 um, uh, megapascal, uh, and this equation can be used for uh, for for cast iron. Uh, remember, as I said, um, the endurance limit value that is uh, tabulated. Uh, or measured using the test by Wooler uh, is for highly polished specimens. They are tested in a lab environment at specific temperature. Um, and then this means that we have to, in real life, um, these factors is going to change a little bit uh, because the, uh, the, 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 the surface finish of the component that you're gonna use uh, is one factor, the temperature is another factor, the size is another factor. So we need to take all these factors into account. In order to do that, we have to correct this value. So this SE value, we have to uh, get a corrected uh, or a working value for SE. So normally we're gonna call it SE uh, prime. So this corrected value, which is SE prime, is equal to the value that we've got from Wooler test multiplied by a set of factors. And those factors, they take into account the, for example, 
uh, the size effect or the temperature effect or the surface finish effect uh, and so on. So this is what we are gonna do in the end. We just uh, take this SE value multiplied by a set of factors to take into account all those um, effects uh, to get like a working value, which is SE prime. This is going to be the last uh, slide in this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, we need to think about the stress concentrations as well, because uh, as I said earlier, um, so, so some like uh, cracks in the material, uh, some uh, defects in the material. Um, if you change, if you have those sharp uh, edges or sh sharp corners, sorry, um, or a change in the, um, the, the dimensions. So all these uh, parameters or all these geometries or features, they magnify the stress. Even if you have a, a, a bar uh, with a hole inside, and then this is under tension, you have a tensile force here. You see, if you uh, draw the distribution of the stresses here at this point, far away from, uh, fr from the hole, so the, the stress here is uniform. It is the force divided by the area, okay? But if you, uh, if you just study the, uh, the stress distribution around this hole, you will find that here, uh, the stress is high and here uh, the stress is, uh, is as normal. So this line here and this line are the same, but the stresses around the hole uh, are quite high. So, and they found that for this particular case, uh, the stresses around the hole is equal to three times the stresses or the nominal stresses here. So if this is the nominal stress sigma zero and around the hole, if we have sigma max here, so sigma max, which is the maximum stress uh, around the hole divided by the nominal stress uh, is equal to around three, okay? Um, so the stress concentration means that it uh, magnifies the stress, the stresses that we have. And if the stresses are magnified, this means that cracks can start from here. So local, uh, a permanent deformation can start from here or plastic deformation and then st cracks starts from here to propagate and then uh, eventually to uh, fracture uh, the, the component. Okay, so we cannot just design any component in engineering without introducing uh, those kind of uh, uh, stress risers. Uh, for example, the oil lubrication hole in a crankshaft the key ways that we use to couple the uh, gear, for example, or the pulley to the shaft uh, and so on, or any changes, um, the, the changes uh, in the, uh, the diameters of the shaft or the, the diameter of the shaft uh, that we use to uh, axially locate, for example, the, um, uh, something like the, the, the bearing. So in order to locate the bearing at this point here, uh, so we have to have this shoulder and having a shoulder means that uh, one way of that to have a shoulder, but uh, having a shoulder means that we've changed the, uh, the, the cross-sectional area. And the, when you have this change in sections, so you have the corners uh, and eventually you have a stress risers here. So you are just increasing or magnifying the stresses here. Right, so... Um, we have to take this into account as well because uh, you have um, stress concentration locations and you have fluctuating stresses. This eventually could lead to uh, a failure or a, a crack that grows and then reaches the critical uh, uh, length or the cr critical crack size and then eventually leads to a failure. So we have to take this into account uh, in our loading. So the, the applied stress that you apply uh, to the component um, has to be um, modified by this kind of stress concentration factor. Uh, there are uh, charts to find the stress concentration factor. And here, uh, uh, as you see on the screen, you have three different charts. Uh, they are for a step round shaft, okay? Uh, and the first one here is you have a direct tension. The second one uh, here, you have bending. 
and the third one here you have torsion. So you have a step shaft and this step shaft is um, uh, subjected to either uh, direct tension, bending or torsion. So based on these charts and similar other uh, other th similar charts, uh, we can find the what's called the stress concentration factor. So the stress concentration factor actually um, it just indicates how much greater the stress is at a fillet compared to the nominal stress. Um, similar to the example that we're talking about here, we said that the the maximum stress around the hole over the nominal stress is around three. This three in this case is your stress concentration factor or magnification factor. In order to find the stress or the theoretical value of the stress concentration factor here, um, for example, if we focus on the first one, so you need uh, uh, two ratios. The first one is R over D, where R is the radius of this fillet and D is the diameter of the uh, section. Uh, then you need another ratio, which is capital D over small d, where the capital D is the diameter of the uh, the larger section. So based on that, uh, let's say when you divide the R over D, it gives you 0 point, 0 0.15. So from here, you start drawing a vertical line. And uh, if the capital D over uh, small d gives you 1.5, so you intersect this uh, line here and then go to the left to find what's called the k sub t where the k sub t is the this factor magnification factor of the stress or they call it theoretical stress concentration factor the same applies for both the bending and torsion okay so you need again r over d and d over d and then you pick up the curve to find the value so eventually uh, your KT value or theoretical stress concentration value is equal to the ratio between the maximum uh, uh, the maximum stress around the uh, discontinuity that you have uh, in the uh, part uh, over the nominal stress. So you have a maximum stress here and the nominal stress. And by the way, the nominal stress uh, is calculated based on the smaller section. So for example, here, when you calculate the nominal stress, it is if this is a shaft, so the cross-sectional area of the, uh, the the smaller part here is pi over 4d to the power uh, 2. Uh, this is the cross-sectional area. So, and then sigma naught here is equal to, if we consider the first case, which is tension, so it's, it is the force over this area. So, and the area here is calculated based on the smaller cross-section. You see here the stress concentration factor KT is function only of uh, the geometry of the material. We didn't talk uh, about any materials, for example. It is the geometry of the component. Uh, we were uh, focusing here on two ratios, uh, R over D and D over D, and all these ratios are just geometrical ratios. So uh, it does not include any uh, material uh, information here or any e even relative size. Um, the thing is that uh, because we did not focus or the discussion about the stress concentration does not uh, include uh, any material. So we have to somehow include this into our calculations. But it has been found that some materials they are quite sensitive to uh, scratches uh, and notches and some other materials they are not quite sensitive so they they come up with they came up with another uh, uh, idea or factor so if the material is not sensitive to the existence of notches so we ha don't have to use the full value of kt where kt is called the theoretical stress concentration factor. Um, so it is the maximum value, if you want, for this uh, sort of uh, factor. So, but if the material does not show uh, high sensitivity of for scratches and for uh, uh, notches, so we can use the reduced value of this factor. Reduced value means that uh, 0 0.5 of this value, or 0 0.9 of this value, or 0 0.75 of this value. 
So there is another factor, which is called fatigue stress concentration factor, where um, you have two options here, if you see. It is the ratio between the endurance limit of the material of notch-free specimen divided by the endurance limit of the material of notched specimen. Imagine you have two specimens, exactly the same geometry, exactly the same surface finish, same size, Everything is the same, same material, but one has a notch and the other one does not have a notch. Then you test them both and then you find your endurance limit for both. And then you divide these two values. What if Kf is equal to one? If Kf is equal to one, it means that this material is not sensitive to notches because uh, regardless of the notch it gives us or uh, we were able to obtain the same endurance uh, endurance limit of the material. So based on this uh, concept, they have introduced another uh, factor called notch sensitivity, where Q, small Q, uh, or notch sensitivity is equal to Kf minus one over Kt minus one. So we understand now the difference between KF and KT. So KT is the theoretical stress concentration factor, which is based on the geometry. KF is the reduced value based on the sensitivity of the material. And we have two options here in this case. If Q is equal to zero, this means that KF is equal to one. So, and as I said, if KF is equal to one, it means that the material has no sensitivity to notches. But the other extreme, is uh, k is equal to one. If k is equal to one, so kf is equal to uh, kt. And if kf is equal to kt, so it's not a reduced value, it's a full value now. And if it is a full value, it means that the material uh, is, is highly sensitive to notches. It was also found based on experiments that this q value uh, is not a function only of this kf kt value. It has to do with the, uh, the, the the radius or the size of the notch. So you see here in this graph, it is function of two things. It is function of the material and it is function of the size of the notch. So if the notch size is high, so this Q value becomes high. If the notch size is small, so this Q value becomes small. So if you pick up like aluminum, for example, so you see here for aluminum, and then if you, when you just uh, increase the value of the notch, so the, the value of Q increases as you go here, okay? So um, this is one thing. Another thing is that the, the material itself for the same sort of uh, notch size, so if you have, uh, so aluminum shows a specific value for a notch sensitivity, steel shows another value and steel quenched and timbered uh, just shows another value. So it's, it, it is a function of the material, it is function of the size. So this equation, the previous equation can be simplified to this, um, this form of the equation where Kf, which is the uh, fatigue stress concentration factor is equal to one plus uh, the notch sensitivity multiplied by kt um, minus one. If q is equal to zero again, so this means that kf is equal to one and the material is not sensitive to any uh, notches. If you are in doubt, we can just simply assume that q is equal to one. Q is equal to one means that kf is equal to kt and this is the uh, extreme value that we use the full value of the stress concentration fact. I'm gonna now start talking about the fluctuating stresses, but before I do that, do you guys have any questions before I move forward? Any questions, please? No, sir. Okay, thank you. So the next part of this uh, lecture is fluctuating stresses. This is kind of, we have left-hand side and right-hand side of the equation, of the design equation. The left-hand side of the equation is about uh, the applied stresses, the fluctuating stresses. So now from this point, uh, we are talking about the left-hand side of the equation, which is the applied stresses to the component. Previously, we were talking about the right-hand side of the design equation, where we were talking about the endurance strength of the material 
and how it is found uh, and so on. Though the notch sensitivity and the stress concentration has to do with the left-hand side of the equation because this is the magnification uh, of the applied stresses, okay? So this graph here shows you a number of stress states. Uh, A, for example, which is this one, shows you fluctuating stress with high frequency ripple because it is not like smooth. It just shows some ripples inside due to some uh, dynamic effects. And this is, again, it's just a fluctuating stress. So we have time here on the x-axis and we have stress on the uh, y-axis. So B and C, these two, they show uh, non-sinusoidal fluctuating stresses. It's not sinusoidal. It doesn't take the shape of sine or cosine waves. But here, D here shows us sinusoidal fluctuating stresses. So again, here you have sigma on the y-axis. You have T on the, or time on the x-axis. And in this case, uh, you have maximum stress, sigma max. So this is from Z, from the x-axis till the top point here, we have sigma max, okay? And then from again, the x-axis till the lower point here, we have what's called the sigma minimum. So this is the minimum and the maximum values of the applied uh, stress. Uh, in the middle uh, or uh, the between these two extremes, we have here, uh, what's called the mean value of the stress. So the distance between the X axis till here is sigma mean, sigma sub M. And the distance between the mean line till the top from here to here, let's use another color. So this here from the mean till the top here, uh, we have sigma R, which is the reverse distress. So we have maximum, which is from X axis till the top point. We have minimum from the X axis till the bottom point. And then between the mean value to the top or the mean value to the bottom, we have what's called the reverse stress. So the difference between this case here and the next one, if you look here, you, you see that sigma minimum here is equal to zero. So because uh, the, the points here, they touch the x-axis, it means that sigma minimum is, is zero in this case. And the last one, it's called completely reversed sinusoidal uh, stresses, means that uh, sigma max uh, and sigma minimum are equal, but opposite in the sign. So um, just sigma max here is equal to uh, sigma minimum, so the same value, but maybe it's just a negative sign because here uh, from the x-axis to here is positive maximum from the x-axis to here is the minimum, which is um, uh, on the opposite side. In this case, sigma mean is equal to zero. The mean value is uh, between these two um, and it is equal to zero. So normally we use these two equations to calculate the mean stress and the reverse stress, okay? Uh, so the, again, the mean stress is the distance from the X axis like here, sigma mean, uh, from the X axis to the uh, somewhere between these maximum and minimum. And the reverse is between the mean to the maximum or the mean to the minimum. Mathematically, you can use these two equations to calculate the mean and the reverse stresses. So first you need to identify the maximum and the minimum stresses based on your application. And then you calculate uh, both the, uh, the mean stress and the reverse stress. So sigma mean is sigma maximum plus sigma minimum over two. This is how you calculate the, me the mean stress. And sigma reversed is sigma maximum minus sigma minimum over two. So one, you add them together, and the other one, you subtract subtract them. So in, in this case, um, we can just think of this as you have a component, and then you apply a STD, mean stress. So the, the, the mean stress itself is like this. It's just a line, 
this is the time, this is sigma. So in this case, you have a mean stress. So it is between here to here, you have sigma mean, right? So you have a steady mean stress applied to your component and superimposed on that, you have this reversed or fluctuating stress. We are as if you are applying two stresses on your component. So the distance between here to here is sigma r. Okay. Um, then you need to uh, notice one uh, important thing as well is like tensile here should be positive and compression should be negative in these two equations. If sigma max is uh, tensile, so it's you, you just put it as positive. And for example, if sigma minimum is uh, compression, so you have to uh, use the negative sign for this. So signs are important here. So here for these two, we can just think of this sigma as either direct, direct stress like tension or compression, or we can think of this as bending. But the same applies for torsional shear stresses as well. So if you have fluctuating uh, uh, torque, and this torque develops um, shear stresses. So you can calculate the mean and the reversed, um, the mean and the reversed shear stresses based on the same equation. You just uh, use tau max, tau mini, instead of uh, sigma max and sigma mini. So the question now is that we know that we can do something like this. We superimpose, you just have a steady, load, steady mean stress, and then superimpose on this uh, steady or mean stress, you superimpose the fluctuating or the reversed stress. But the question, this question is quite important. It says, how does the magnitude of the mean and reversed stresses affect the life of the component? Because now we are talking about sigma mean and reversed stress. So, Based on this, sigma mean can change. It can become like uh, positive or negative or even zero, right? So it can go above the x-axis, below the x-axis. It can become uh, coincide with the x-axis. So sigma mean could have like positive values, negative values, zero values. It could be positive but small value or positive but large value. So we, we have different values for sigma. The same for sigma, uh, sorry, we have uh, different values for sigma m or the mean. The same for sigma r or re reversed. It, these fluctuations could be small or large. So something we can have something like this. Could be like small magnitude or it can be something like it just goes something like that. So it means that we have to understand how these the changing these both sigma mean and sigma r, how they change, uh, or the changes in sigma mean and sigma r, how they change or affect the life of a component. So this was done uh, by experiments, of course. They, they, they keep like changing the value for sigma m from positive to negative to zero. And then they, keep cha they kept changing the values for sigma r for different values as well. And then eventually they found uh, this kind of uh, graph where you have here on the right hand side you have the tensile and on the left hand side you have the compression so the x axis here is sigma mean and the vertical axis is sigma r so you have the reverse stress on the y axis and you have the mean stress on the x axis then if you here it is like normalized values so if you here uh, divide this mean value because the, the maximum kind of steady state uh, stress value is going to be its ultimate. So if you divide this mean value by its ultimate, and if you divide this sigma r value by the endurance strength, because this is the maximum that you can go for fluctuating stress or reverse distress. So you can have this kind of here, the maximum is one and here the maximum is one. So one means that sigma m is equal to its ultimate. So you apply sigma mean on the component, which is equal to the ultimate tensile strength of the material. And here you apply the um, reverse distress, which is equal to the endurance strength of the material. And anything in between, you can just uh, start reducing 
the value for sigma r. And then from this value, you start reducing the value of uh, sigma mean. And then in between, based on the combination of these uh, two values, uh, you can, they've started like testing the, the specimens. So here we have the same geometry, uh, the same material, but uh, the, the level of the stresses were changing. So if these points here, they show the, the test values. So for example, if we pick this point, it means that sigma r was here uh, with this value and or sigma r over sigma uh, e was here uh, having this value and sigma mean over its ultimate is having this value. When you apply on the component, this sigma m and sigma r, uh, so the material fails at this point and so on. So they, they've started developing some sort of uh, uh, models uh, for these, right? Uh, you see here, the greatest reversed stress is the uh, endurance strength. That's why it is here sigma r over se. And the ultimate tensile strength is the maximum for sigma means. So we have sigma mean here over s ultimate. Okay, um, so based on that, any point uh, on or above uh, this line here um, is denoted as um, just failure. So if it is uh, above the point, sorry, just above, if it is above the point, above the line, uh, so it is failure. So here is, we, we consider this as failure. Any point on or below the line is considered safe. So in order to have a safe design, your sigma mean and uh, sigma r should be somewhere here in this area. Okay, so, but if the, uh, the point uh, lies on the, uh, let me just rephrase this. So the, what we see here is called the, uh, the failure envelope. Any point that lies on the line or below the line is, Safe. And any point that lies above the line is failure. Okay, so on the line is safe as well. Uh, sorry, I said this wrong, I think. So um, in here, you see there is a, a notice here, an important one for the compression uh, side. You see, for the compression side, it means that we keep like increasing the value here of sigma mean. But with increasing the value of sigma mean going in this direction, so the value of uh, sigma reverse does not, is not affected at all. But here, if you compare this to the tensile side, here when you just keep increasing the value of sigma mean along the x-axis, so the value of the uh, sigma r goes down, should go down if we were to follow this line. So this is a very important uh, notice because here, it means that when the mean stress is negative, so the mean stress is negative means that uh, you have the x-axis here, you have the time, you have sigma, and then when, when you just apply the load, so your sigma mean value is here. So it's below the uh, value. So it's here. And then you can, again, I, still you can superimpose, um, why I've picked this one? you can superimpose the, um, the fluctuating stress, but the, the thing is that sigma mean value is negative, okay? So when it is negative, it has no influence on the magnitude of the reverse stress. So when it is negative, uh, then you can change the magnitude of the, uh, amplitude, the, the, the reverse the stress here and the life uh, of the, um, of the component is not affected. So you can still use the same mean with like high value of uh, reverse distress um, without affecting the life of the, um, the, 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 the component. So going here, uh, you see here, all these dots are the uh, experimental points. So these uh, are the values that or the endurance strength value or uh, sigma r over se based on the experiments. So in, in this case, uh, if you have a negative or compressive mean stress, 
It just means that the reverse the strength that you can use can even exceed the endurance strength of the material. So because the endurance strength, look at this point, for example, this point is quite close to 1.5. So it's going to fail at around uh, when the sigma R is 1.5 of the endurance strength. So in this case, if you have um, negative mean uh, stress, you still can have high reverse distress values without uh, affecting the life of the component. Because they have found this uh, imposing some compressive stresses is quite beneficial to the life of a fatigue component or a, a component that is affected by fatigue. So engineers, they have started to think how to induce or create even compressive stresses uh, on the surface of uh, materials, as we'll see uh, later on. So the uh, fluctuating stresses, when, the, when we look at the positive side, so here we were just focusing on the compressive uh, side, but looking at the uh, tensile side here. So uh, you see here, as the mean stress increases, so the reverse stress becomes smaller. So when you increase the mean stress, so the reverse stress has to be smaller, just to follow the line, if you want. And vice versa, when the mean stress becomes smaller, you need to, uh, you can, sorry, you can increase the reverse, uh, reverse the stress. And uh, again, you still like in the, uh, in this uh, envelope, the failure envelope. So here, uh, if you increase following this line, it is like negative with a negative slope. So you increase the, when you increase sigma mean, uh, so the, uh, this value sigma r goes down. So there are some uh, um, kind of criteria or theories here uh, for uh, describing the positive side or the thin side side of this curve. I'm sure that you've seen this before, but um, if you have on the uh, y axis here, you have the reverse distress, and on the x axis, you have the mean stress. So we can uh, follow one of these uh, uh, criteria. We have Goodman criteria, we have modified Goodman criteria, we have Soderberg, and we we'll have uh, Gerber uh, parabola. So if we consider the uh, mean stress, the maximum value of the mean stress is, is yield. So um, we just pick this point. This is the maximum of um, the mean stress. And if we consider the maximum value for the, um, the reverse stress is SE or the endurance limit, then uh, Soderberg has connected these two with a line, with a straight line. Okay, this is Soderberg. And uh, Goodman has decided that, okay, I can, for brittle materials, for example, we don't have the yield strength, so we can use the ultimate tensile strength. Uh, then he connected this S yield but to the S ultimate by a straight line. So each straight line has uh, an equation. So this is what we'll see in a moment. Um, so the Soderberg here, which is the, this line here, the first line at the bottom uh, is more conservative, okay? It is quite close to uh, the origin. Uh, it is more conservative compared to uh, any other one, to Goodman, for example, or modified Goodman. Um, so Gerber has decided that he's gonna uh, connect these two uh, extreme values by a parabola. So there is another equation for that. So these are kind of the models uh, that we can use um, to study the, the relation between the mean and the reverse distress um, uh, on a component that is uh, subjected to fatigue. In this case, we are going to focus more on Soderberg criteria. Um, having a straight line is kind of simpler mathematically. Uh, and it is uh, here when you consider the ultimate, the, the yield strength, it is more conservative, it is more uh, safer, okay? Um, so in, in this case, we are gonna consider and focus and use in our uh, project, we're gonna use the Soderberg criteria. 
So we're going to use the most conservative line, which is this one here, okay? So, but what is the, uh, how we can find an equation based on this line? So uh, first, uh, let's say that this is the, um, the maximum, that is the yield strength based on the mean. So the mean stress can go all the way down to the, all, the yield strength of the material. And the reverse distress uh, can go all the way to, the, um, to become the uh, endurance strength of the material. Um, but here, if we just divide um, these values by the factor of safety, okay, for, our, for design purposes. Um, so we consider that the factor of safety, of course, is higher than one. So the factor of safety is higher than one. So we can, if we divide this S yield value by a factor of safety, and then divide the, uh, the uh, endurance strength by a factor of safety. So this just makes it even uh, uh, safer to take into account any uncertainties in the material characterization, any uncertainties in uh, the loads or measuring or calculating the loads and so on. So we have to use the factor of safety. Um, in this case, any combination of uh, reverse distress and mean stress, if it is in this shaded area, uh, if it is in this shaded area, so it means that it is safe. So this is the kind of the safe stress area. As I said earlier, if uh, the stress value that you're applying is above the line, so it means failure. So, um, and if it is on the line or below the line, it is safe. But even just to take into account uncertainties, any uncertainties in the loading or the materials, so we, we divide these values by um, the, the factor of safety. So here uh, on this point, if you pick this point, so you have here the mean value, sigma mean, and here you have the reversed value, but the reversed value is multiplied by this factor, uh, KF. It is the fatigue stress concentration factor. And if you remember, we said that we have to take those uh, stress concentrations or stress risers into account. That's why we multiply the reverse distress by this factor um, to take into account the magnification of the stress due to uh, uh, any stress concentration uh, geometries, okay? So the, the math here uh, is as follows. So um, this is gonna be uh, last slide before the break. So in this case, um, we can here uh, develop this equation or find this equation based on similar triangle. So for example, if you look at this triangle here, this one. So this side of the triangle between these two points is uh, Kf times sigma r. And this side of the triangle is uh, is yield over the factor of safety minus sigma u, okay? And if this uh, triangle is similar to this triangle, the larger one here, so it is equal to this side, which is obviously SE over factor of safety, divided by this side, which is S yield over the factor of safety. Factor of safety here cancels. So we have um, S yield over uh, S endurance strength over the yield strength. Then you can rearrange this equation to have the factor of safety, still the factor of safety is here on the left-hand side. So the factor of safety is equal to the yield strength of the material over the mean stress plus the fatigue stress concentration factor times is yield over the endurance strength multiplied by the reverse stress. So for this particular equation, if you consider that sigma r is equal to zero, sigma r is equal to zero means that we don't have reverse stress, we have only mean stress. So in this case, if you look at, into this equation, so this means that this term goes to zero and eventually the factor of safety is equal to S yield over sigma mean, which is again, uh, as if the uh, component is loaded stati uh, statically. 